If you're watching this channel, it's because you don't enjoy watching the world squander what Christendom built, but you want to do your part. And chances are you've heard me mention a great means by doing just that. Email made by and for Catholics. Check out fide.email. That's F-I-D-E-I -E dot email. Built for Catholic individuals, families, organizations, and groups. They're private, secure, and of course, they're Catholic. And they're offering two months off on your first year for an annual subscription if you enter the coupon code return to tradition without spaces that's the name of this channel without spaces at checkout it's been a lot of talk over francis's new dicastery chief and it hasn't died down in the slightest quite the contrary in fact the man's presence has caused scandal not only because of his tasteless poetry that some conservative catholics are still tripping over themselves to defend claiming the translation being circulated by traditionalists is bad when it's not, but also because his own response to the questions about his poetry have been abysmal, with him basically writing off his adult-oriented impure writings as being youthful indiscretions. You know, those kind of youthful indiscretions that priests are famous for, if you can believe it. But his poetry isn't the real problem with him. As we've discussed before, the man has played fast and loose with Catholic morality, and especially that sin that James Martin has a strange fascination with for a priest. So today, let's take a look at the latest on the story, because quite frankly, it's a story that's eye-opening. We turn to American Magazine for the establishment modernist defense of what's going on with soon-to-be Cardinal Victor Manuel Fernandez. The Jesuit outlet published an article on July 6th take, talking about his bad poetry and his take on various doctrinal issues and the scandal surrounding the Archbishop's appointment to the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, which is the Vatican office held, that was once held by Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger before he was elected Pope Benedict XVI. And Benedict is key here, as we will see from the following quote, but that's not all. You see, there's now a new theology in the Church, and it's not the nouveau theology of the past post-Vatican II era, but something more, shall we say, liberating. The following comes from the author's exchange with Dr. Massimo Fascioli, one of Francis's mouthpieces in the church in America. He's an Italian scholar and is absolutely loyal to the new religion in Rome. Get ready for this, folks. It's a bit unsettling. Quote, The biggest change he, Massimo Fascioli, sees in the appointment of Archbishop Fernandez is the shift away from what he calls the Ratzinger era of the last 40 years. Then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, who would become Pope Benedict XVI, was appointed head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in 1981 by Pope John Paul II, a position Cardinal Ratzinger held until he was elected Pope. Cardinal Ratzinger was succeeded as CDF head, first by the American Cardinal William Lovada, whom Benedict appointed, then by Cardinal Gerhard Mueller, who was a follower of Ratzinger, a devotee, and most recently by Cardinal Luis Ladadia, a Jesuit who was the Congregation's secretary under Mueller. So this is a turning point from these last 40 years, and most visibly, a departure because Fernandez is a Latin American, Dr. Fascioli said, alluding to how the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith was involved in suppressing Latin American liberation theologians following the Second Vatican Council. He described the, quote, Ratzinger era appointees as Germans, usually who were appointed for their opposition to other more progressive German bishops' efforts to liberalize theology. <laughs> See where this is going, folks? In contrast to the academic desktop theology style of German theologians, Dr. Fascioli said, Latin American theology is characterized by working among the faithful and bringing, being, quote, in touch with the existential condition of real people. Wow. He anticipates that this new style will face some opposition within the Vatican. I think that Fernandez might find in Rome an environment that will not be very welcoming, because if we have learned anything over the past ten years of Francis, if it has not been easy for the Pope, it will not be easy for the men he's appointed. End quote. What Massimo Fagioli, yes, I'm pronouncing his name wrong because of uh, how he spells his name, what he's describing is liberation theology. South American theology is code language for liberation theology, which has a long, sordid history in South America, going back to like the 1920s or so, and was imported to South America by agents of that evil empire from behind the Iron Curtain. That's where it comes from. That's a historic fact. It took hold in South America as a means of turning Catholicism in South America into a form of communism meant to subvert those countries and destroy the faith of the believers. That's where it comes from. We have the documents from behind the Iron Curtain. 
Liberation theology has been formally condemned by the church in the 1970s and 1980s and 1990s, but of course that doesn't mean much these days because it comes from the Ratzinger era, and we're now at a turning point. Everything is up for grabs now. Though they won't say they're endorsing a condemned theology, they'll just continue to invite liberation theology figures like the apostate former priest Leonardo Boff and others to influence things in Rome. The real scandal comes from ambiguous words given in interviews, though, with Info Vaticana, because Archbishop Fernandez has been doing that. Now, Info Vaticana is a Spanish language site that's based out of Europe. And in a recent interview, the Archbishop has asked about the church blessing uh, what we like to call around here James Martin Pairings. He says he upholds the church's teaching with the nature of the natural sacrament, and the church cannot provide a blessing that makes it look like the kind of pairing that James Martin likes and thinks that can be blessed. But then Archbishop Fernandez confuses the whole matter by saying that if a blessing for people in these pairings can be crafted that doesn't lead to confusion about the nature of the marital sacrament, then it would have to be analyzed and could possibly be endorsed. Yeah. We saw this with a high-profile priest of the Order of Maciel Maciel, who said on Twitter that two people could have their friendship blessed in a formal ceremony. If that sounds like a smokescreen to you for a blessing of a James Martin pairing, you'd be right, because most people aren't going to go and have their, their little friendships and bromances endorsed by the church. And that priest knows this, too. This entire topic has caused scandal, since it comes from bishops and priests and their officially sanctioned or organizations endorsing a clear break from the morality of the church. And has certainly contributed to some Catholics leaving the faith for Protestant groups or for them going to join the Eastern Schismatics. It also doesn't help that this Archbishop, who Francis appointed to such a key office, said that relationships of this kind that get into activities of the flesh that are clearly condemned by scripture and tradition aren't always sinful. Talk about scandal. You know, these guys like to talk about all this like it's a good thing to cause controversy. Causing controversy, causing scandal, is actually a sin. It is the sin of scandal, which the modern catechism, the one that these guys spent, you know, defend with their dying breath, describes as the following, quote, The sin of scandal is an attitude of behavior which leads another to do evil. The person who gives scandal becomes his neighbor's tempter. He damages virtue and integrity. He may even draw his brother into spiritual death. Our Lord militates against scandal and even ties a curse to those who promote it. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened round his neck and be ended in the depth of the sea. End quote. Mostly. <laughs> one way to give scandal is to tell someone something isn't a sin when it's a sin, leading that person to ruin, such as is the case of all these weird prelates trying to change what the church teaches about certain sins. Scripture tells us, cry out to heaven for justice. A scandal becomes a serious issue when the person committing the scandal has a position of authority in the church. And by the way, the sin of scandal is to be separated from reporting on others causing scandal, by the way, just to be clear about that. But when they have a position of authority, like say being prefect for the dicaster of the doctrine of faith, or when they lead someone to commit a sin, like making them think that James Martin's sin is A-OK -okay and that the church now endorses it, that's a bigger deal than say if a layman were to cause scandal. Now there's an interesting heresy that Archbishop Fernandez has also been alleged to have committed, and that ties brings all this together. He has in the past stated that any diocese in the world could become the See of Peter. That's actually condemned heresy. LifeSite News interviewed Cardinal Gerhard Mueller about his comments in the past about Fernandez being a heretic over this claim. It's interesting because he answers a question that many of you often ask. What allegiance do we owe to Francis? Now, some will disagree with Cardinal Mueller's answer, and I will address that at the end. But here's what he has to say on this. Quote, the decision as to who will become prefect of the principal congregation or dicastery that directly assists the Roman pontiff in his universal magisterium belongs to the Holy Father alone. He must also answer for it in his conscience before Christ, the Lord and head of his church. This does not exclude the concern of many bishops, priests, and faithful throughout the world. They have the right to freely express their concerns. See Lumen Gentium, paragraph 37. The opinion which I criticized at that time that any diocese could become the seat of Peter's successor is already directly qualified by the fathers of Vatican I as a heretical contradiction to the revealed faith in second canon of the Constitution, Pastor Aeternus. Pastor Aeternus is a document from the first Vatican Council. The concept that the Roman pontiff has full, supreme, and universal power over the church, against the Lumagentium, meaning the plenitudo potestatis, has nothing at all to do with 
with the unlimited commands of secular potentates, meaning secular rulers, secular governments, who refer to a higher power. <clears throat> the Church of the Triune God also does not need a new foundation or modernization, as if she has become a dilapidated house, and as if weak men could surpass the divine master builder. She is already historically established in Christ once for all, and perfectly conceived in its doctrine, constitution, and liturgy, in God's plan of salvation. In the Holy Spirit, she continually serves people as the sacrament of the world's salvation. Her teaching is not a program to be improved and updated by men, but the faithful and complete witness of the eschatological revelation of God and his incarnate Son, full of grace and truth. See John chapter two, verse or John chapter one, verse fourteen. The task of the dicastery in the service of the papal magisterium is to show how the doctrine of the faith is biblically founded, how it has developed in the history of dogma, and how its content is expressed in an authoritative way by the magisterium. The religious obedience owed by all Catholics to the universal episcopate, and especially to the Pope, refers only to the supernatural truths of the doctrine of faith and morals, including the natural truths in ontology, epistemology, and ethics which are the presuppositions of the knowability of the word of God in our human minds. The Pope and bishops cannot demand obedience for their private opinions, and certainly not for teachings and actions that would contradict revelation and natural moral law. Well, that's what they're demanding these days, but anyway. This was declared already in 1875 by the German bishops against the misinterpretation of the teachings of Vatican I by the German Chancellor Bismarck. Pope Pius IX expressly agreed with this. The Pope and bishops are bound to Holy Scripture and the apostolic tradition, and by no means sources of additional revelation or of revelation which supposedly needs to be adjusted to be in accord with the present state of science. End quote. quote. And that right there is his categorical condemnation of pretty much everything going on in Rome this, today. Now, the objection some of you will have is that for, you will say that Francis is not the Pope, that a heretic cannot hold the office of Pope. And a couple things to remember here. First, the only person on earth who can actually declare a Pope to be a heretic is another Pope, meaning his successor. Now, some say that the College of Cardinals could do so as a body, but that view is, frankly, highly contested. Second, the argument that a her heretic automatically loses his office is that of St. Robert Bellarmine, and, strictly speaking, has never been adopted by the magisterium of the Church. That may happen someday, but the question will be then to what degree will that be true? How much heresy will it take for a pope to lose his office? If any, then the set of contests will then be correct, since it's easy to show that all the post-Vatican troops could be said to have embraced heresy in some way or another. Now, frankly, I'm not a set of a contest. I don't hold to the set of a contest view. I tend to think the set of I tend to think the set of a contest will never be adopted by the magisterium for some pretty obvious reasons, including questions about the continuity of apostolic succession, as well as some other ones. But I'm not here to adjudicate set of a contism. But I'm curious what you think about this. What do you think about Cardinal Mueller's uh, sort of remarks at the end there? Do you think that that is essentially him just dunking on the uh, incoming prefect for the dicastery of the doctrine of the faith? Do you think that the... Uh, the modernists are just sort of dancing around what they're wanting to do? Or do you think they're being just right up front and honest when they say it's time to break from the Ratzinger era as they bring in the liberation theologians? Let me know what you think of this in the comments, please. And like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help. So to sharing this on social media, that helps too. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.